fatigued, broken, and injured. The remnants of the band of the Horde make haste after their once powerful and great leader, a shell of his former self. This man's dreams, hopes, and work are all hopelessly destroyed, and, as he calls out for salvation, the sky is adorned with a deep, dark red tint that masks the entire area in the colour of blood. Bone-chilling laughter fills the cold, stifling air as the mere mortals look on in despair at the grotesque and horrifying beast before them. The eclipse has begun. Berserk is easily one of the most critically acclaimed and beloved manga series out there, currently sitting on number one manga spot over on my anime list, and not without good reason. The manga tells an epic tale of man vs beast, with fantastic artwork, interesting characters, and some of the most disturbing and downright grotesque artwork I've ever seen in any manga ever. While I personally wouldn't consider Berserk to be a masterpiece or anything, as in fact the more it goes along the more it starts to go around in circles, I can appreciate it why it is so beloved and why it is put on such a high pedestal today and what it did for the manga landscape as a whole. However, when it comes to anime adaptations, they've been less than stellar all around. The infamous 2017 and 2016 adaptations are essentially, at this point, just massive jokes in the community, and for good reason to boot. Both adaptations feature some of the most awkward and jarring CGI animation I've ever seen, combined with strange reworking of the original script, and every time Gut swings his sword, it sounds like a frying pan hitting a piece of metal, even when cutting into flesh. It's so fucking strange that it's actually hilarious, and I burst out laughing every time I hear the fantastic clang sound. The Golden Art Trilogy, produced by Studio 4C, is overall a much better experience than these two series, with much more competent CGI animation, intimates with fantastic looking traditional 2D animation. The only problem I have with these movies is that, as expected of pumping around 100 chapters into three films, they are rushed beyond belief, which kills most of the emotional weight the original story carried, since much of it had to be cut out. And finally, this brings us to the original Berserk adaptation, all the way from 1997, in which, surprisingly, the only good adaptation was produced by the same studio that produced every single Pokemon series. I don't know why, but I find this fact to be delightfully funny. In fact, both Pokemon and Berserk were being produced and aired at roughly the same time. Wouldn't it be funny if one of the episodes of Berserk was accidentally placed in the Pokemon TV time slot or something, and thousands of Japanese children witnessed one of Guts' killing sprees? Yes, I have a sick mind, since that thought alone brings me nothing but pleasure. Anyway, I've talked for far too long. Let's grab a behemoth of a sword, put our grasses on, cause nothing would be wrong, you know, and dive into the hellish fantasy world that is Berserk. Berserk starts up in the present time, where essentially the world has gone to absolute shit. It's dark, miserable, and depressing. As we see our main character, Guts, wander through the lands, adorned with a cloak and a massive lump of steel for a sword, which he then uses to cut a guy in half while he's in a tavern of sorts, effectively rescuing a young girl from a group of men. Later on in the episode, we see that Guts suffers from horrible traumatic nightmares, which are accompanied by visions of demons, before having a rather kick-ass fight with a giant snake-like demon in real life. The introductory first episode mainly serves as a foundation block for the rest of the series to be built upon, and is quite effective in generating intrigue from the audience, not only from the atmosphere established or the fight scenes, but from all the subtle little hints the show gives us without ever having to resort to use an expository dialogue. Everything is conveyed through the visuals alone, from Guts' horrific nightmares, to the state of the world, as well as Guts' several body disfigurements, from only having one arm and one eye, as well as having a brand on his neck that bleeds frequently. All of these elements are what drives the rest of the narrative as the audience is left to speculate how Guts came to be this way and why the world is in such ruin, and these questions are directly given to us as we watch the rest of the show, since the entirety of the series is essentially one massive flashback to an earlier time of Guts' life, as we see him join a mercenary guild called the Band of the Horde and fight alongside a proud and rather kind man called Griffith, whom we first meet in a certain episode. In fact, some great use of juxtaposition and generating audience intrigue is used once again in the first episode, when we hear two men talking about King Griffith, and they remark that they have to watch what they say, in fear of him. As an audience, this creates a sense of intrigue, as we wonder to ourselves how such a calm and rather spiritual man could become so feared throughout the world of this narrative. Anyway, back to the plot. Guts joined a mercenary group called the Band of the Horde, led by a man named Griffith, as previously mentioned, 
an extremely proud, respected and headstrong man. Where his dream of having his own country is the only thing that drives him. The rest of the series he's ducked slowly more up to the Band of the Horde, as the group slowly become more powerful, taking on huge armies in war, eventually earning nobility from the king, before seeing everything crash to the ground in the final two episodes of the show. Berserk is not a series filled to the brim with symbolism or allegorical writing, barring a few scenes that is. But what sells the entirety of the Golden Age art is how tightly written everything is as a whole. Everything is insanely interesting to watch unfold, and the various war scenes are so well executed since the characters are very likeable, thus creating out of tension and states, and what each character believes in idealistically and how these complement each other are enough to hold the show together. Each event plays like a larger factor into the story, which makes everything incredibly satisfying to witness. The best example of this is in episode 6, when Guts and Griffith fight off a giant demon called Zod the Immortal, who retreats after noticing Griffith's necklace, the Behelit, before delivering a bad omen to Guts, that anyone who does stay with Griffith will reach an unfortunate end, foreshadowing future events in the narrative. Berserk is, at its most fundamental level, a tale of a man, in this case our main protagonist Guts, trying to search for a place in the world and a purpose for being, in essence his own dream, rather than following Griffith's dream. What makes the Golden Age art so incredibly addicting to watch is seeing each character grow during the duration of the show, their relationships as well as the constant plot twists and acts of revenge enacted in the story. The narrative's pacing is pretty consistent and very strong, always pushing forward at a comfortable pace, often wrapping up various plot threads while introducing new ones, keeping things interesting and fresh. What helps sell the emotional weight of Berserk is how attached we become to these characters as actual people, much like how Guts becomes more attached to the people of the Band of the Hawk himself. As Guts learns more and more about them and opens up more to them as well, so do we as an audience member, which makes the final two episodes all the more heart hitting in an event called the Eclipse. While I won't get too much into the nitty gritty, since the scene is far more emotional the less you know about it, I will say that this scene is easily one of my favourite moments in any piece of fiction ever. The amount of emotions I felt during the Eclipse is staggering, ranging from almost being on tears, to anger and downright depression. The end of Berserk is visceral, disturbing and grotesque, and this is only emphasised more in the manga, with incredibly detailed artwork. If I do have one complaint about the narrative of Berserk, before diving into the characters, then that is the ending, and how abruptly it seems to end. The final scene sees Guts streaming in anger, before audibly cutting to the end credits, followed by a time skip of about a few years in, in, with Guts in the present day. Now, of course, I'm not expecting a resolution to the entire story, since after 20 years, the author himself still hasn't finished writing Berserk, because he'd much rather play Idol Master than actually finish writing the goddamn series, but I was at least expecting a conclusion to the arc that we were in. Ending the show this way feels kind of anticlimactic and lazy, and is honestly quite a kick in the nuts to the audience. Undoubtedly, the trots of the narrative is the relationship between Guts, Griffith and Casca, and how each person grows as individuals. Griffith, as previously mentioned, is an extremely proud and, as we are led to believe at first, a kind man. At least to his own men anyway. Stopping at nothing to attain his dream, he will do anything no matter the cost, from sleeping with old men to gain money for an army, to sending Guts to assassinate anyone who poses a threat to him within the higher ups of the castle. Guts and Griffith's relationship feels genuine and organic, and builds into a sense of camaraderie as the show goes along, with the underlying idea that Griffith owns Guts as a person. It's more accurate to say, perhaps, that Griffith eventually cannot function even as a person when Guts eventually leaves to pursue and find his own dream in life, as Griffith breaks down afterwards. This character arc he embarks on, and character in general, is easily one of the most interesting characters, not only in the show, but perhaps my personal favourite in the medium. One of my favourite scenes in the show is when Griffith is speaking to Princess Charlotte, with Castor and Guts both within hearing distance, as Griffith remarks that he believes a true friend is one that doesn't follow someone else's dream, as Guts has been doing all along, but following his own path in life which is perhaps the trigger for Guts to eventually venture out of the Band of the Horde. The irony lies in the fact that even though Guts would be classified as a true friend under this ideology, projected by Driven for leaving and finding his own dream, he breaks down afterwards and blames Guts for destroying his own dream, and the aftermath is rather depressing too. His mental hang-ups near the end of the series are explored well enough to justify his actions, to a certain extent anyway, making for an interesting character study for someone who has to carry the burden of thousands of soldiers' deaths, all of whom chose to follow him and his dream. Guts' character also receives a lot of development as well, as we see him warm up to the rest of the Band of the Horde and finally find a place he can call home after living a life of loneliness after his first father figure attempted to kill him. 
The scenes where Dutz is messing around with his men are genuinely charming and some of my favourite moments in the entire show. Besides from being one of the most badass characters around, capable of swinging a massive sword and in some instances taking out 100 men all on his own, he is fundamentally a broken person at heart, with frequent traumatic nightmares plaguing his slumber. One of the best scenes in the show comes from when Dutz accidentally kills an innocent child after believing him to be someone else and the implications that arise for this character as a result of this. It physically and emotionally tears him up, and he has to live on with the burden of this sin. It's genuinely one of my favourite moments in the show. Finally we have Casca, and seeing her and Guts' relationship play out is easily one of the most satisfying aspects of the show for me. Casca is the only woman in the band of the Hawks, and probably the only woman in the entire battlefield. Her struggles with being a woman, and the entire theme surrounding it, are handled pretty well, most notably when she experiences a period whilst on a battlefield and falls ill. Her slow warming up to Guts throughout the duration of the show feels natural, as if it were a real relationship, and her idealisation of Griffith is explained to us, and we can perfectly understand her apprehensive attitude when we first meet her. The other characters in the Band of the Horde don't get nearly as much attention, but each, at the very least, have their own reasons for following Griffith, making them feel more like characters than emotionless planks of wood. The animation is pretty consistent for the most part, with more emphasis on super detailed steels, which is most effectively used during the Eclipse to pervade Dutz's raw anger. The backgrounds are also very well detailed as well, and the anime does fall out with its blood and nudity, featuring plenty of bloody corpses, albeit nowhere near as bloody and graphic as the manga. As a spectacle alone, the show is entertaining as fuck. Seeing people fight each other with swords and as such in a medieval fashion will never get old for me. Berserk also has one of my all-time favourite soundtracks, with each track fitting the theme of each episode perfectly. While I'd rather underutilise greatly in my eyes, the track called Forces, where it was best used during the third episode, is my favourite of the entire series. Every time I hear it, I can't help but get pumped up. The rest of the soundtrack is also fantastic, especially the theme Behalit, which has a very mystical fantasy feel to it. The entire soundtrack just streams fantasy adventure, with the exception of the opening however, which is so bad that it's actually great. Not only does the theme and more upbeat acoustics not fit with the tone of the show, especially in later episodes, the attempts of singing in English are absolutely dreadful, so much so that a line that is supposed to say, put your glasses on, sounds like put your grasses on. So put your grasses on. There are some nice visuals however, most disturbing being a shot of a tree, where we see a bunch of hanging bodies against the red background, which is a reference to how Dutz was actually born. It's admittedly pretty funny to listen to, but it did actually draw on me as the show went on, much like Grass now I think about it. In conclusion, I love Berserk. Its writing is tight and consistent, always pushing the story forward. It has very memorable and likeable characters, while also utilising shot factor and draw in sensible ways, and never utilising them to craft empathetic backstories for the audience by manipulating their emotions. And the amount of excitement I felt while watching the story is absolutely staggering. Berserk is a myriad of very different emotions, and as I said previous times in this review, I will not be forgetting the Eclipse anytime soon and I do recommend Berserk. It is a fantastic dark fantasy narrative, one of the best that I've ever seen. And if you're looking for something more darker, then I'd highly recommend that and then reading the manga straight afterwards. Thank you for taking the time to watch my review. If you want to read more of my reviews, then hop on over to my anime list where a link will be in the description below where you can read a myriad of all my reviews that I've written over the past year. And new videos will be out every Sunday, hopefully, if YouTube doesn't mess me up. Thank you for watching. And just remember that by putting your grasses on, nothing will be wrong. <laughs>